I appreciate that. <laughs> Welcome to Celebrate Recovery North here at Fountain City United Methodist Church. Thanks for joining us online. We're going to get started tonight, so here we go. Well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You could stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. Gonna stand my ground. I won't be turned around. And I'll keep this world from dragging me down. Gonna stand my ground. And I won't back down. Just one life In a world that keeps on pushing me around But I'll stand my ground And I won't back down Amen. What a way to start the night. Come on, Tim. Hello. Yes, they got me on. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery North. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and uh, I struggle with control issues, anger, and kind of how those things muddle up my life and my mind at times, but... Uh, I'm just so grateful that I have Jesus in my life and God in my life that gives me that direction and guidance. And, and also I have this family. You know, I can come in here with my troubles, my worries, my stresses, and uh, let them go. Leave them at the door, come in, and I always leave here better than when I came. So I'm just glad that everybody's here tonight. Um, if you're a newcomer, just welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, know that you're an answered prayer know that there's a lot of people in this room that are constantly praying about the new person that's going to walk through our doors. Uh, and don't think for a minute that we don't understand how difficult it is to walk through that door. Everybody here came through for the first time at some point. Um, and it, it's a hard journey. It takes a lot of courage. So we admire you for that. We're glad you're here. Um, some of our announcements. So with the things that I'm saying here, uh, anonymity and confidentiality are paramount here. It's real important, important that what we see here, what is said here, stays here. Uh, here, here. So, yes, just know that. It, you're fine taking some pictures of the band and the lovely Lauren here. She loves you to take pictures of her and post them everywhere. But uh, other than that, just no pictures of everybody out here. And then Mark, too. He's kind of uh, 
you know, he likes his picture too, yeah. every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, yeah, just, just a few, you know, just Mark. Uh, so also we have a uh, small group. So we really want to encourage everybody after our worship hour to go to small group. Uh, they're going to be down the hallway here. We have moved some of our rooms, so look at the signs outside the doors. Uh, we've done a little jostling around and moving things due to size and also some things we're doing with the rooms. You can look at all those up here, and just kind of, they're kind of self-explanatory. If you have any questions, you can grab me, Seth, or any of the other leaders afterwards, and we'll get you where you need to go. Um, we have coffee and things in the back, so just feel free to get up and have coffee or go to the restroom if you need to. Other announcements, um, let me think if there's anything else I want to announce. Sunday worship service, yes. So if you enjoy coming out on Tuesday nights, we also have our services on Sunday. We have a 945 contemporary service here in the gym. It's called The Journey. It's going to look a lot like the service does tonight. It's the same band. Uh, it's a contemporary style. It's a come-as-you-are service. Then we also have an early morning service at 830 down in the traditional sanctuary. And then we also have an 11 o'clock service. I go to the 8.30 service and the 9.45, so if you ever want to come and go to the traditional service, just come sit with me. I'd love you to sit next to me and we can uh, worship together. I'm also here at 9.45 and same thing, just come sit with me. If you don't feel like, like you'd be comfortable coming, you know, just know you're welcome. And it's a welcoming home and a place that you can come on Sunday mornings and worship just like you do on Tuesday nights. Um, we have an offering. The offering basket's back at the door. Over here. I'm sorry about the light. Uh, so if you got something to give, give it. If you don't, don't worry about it. Just offer up a prayer and know that we're just a ministry that if you've got money to give, we use it. It 100% comes back to Celebrate Recovery, and we use it to fund this worship hour, also fund the other things that we do and, and help people out within this community. Um, and if you don't, like I said, just offer, we just ask you to offer up a prayer about that. Well, I think that's got everything. Uh, if y'all will, I think we'll bow our heads and let me just pray us into the evening. God, just thank you for this gorgeous day. You know, we walk out and we see the beautiful sunlight and it warms our heart, Lord. And just like you do when we think about you and we have a relationship with you. Lord, I would ask that you just allow each one of us to settle this evening and open up our hearts and our minds to you. Allow us to invite the Holy Spirit that comes so strong as the band plays and sings it into the room, Lord. We're gathered here in the name of Jesus tonight, and Lord, we know that when you, we do that, you just, you will move. And Lord, my prayer is that just somebody that's walked into the door tonight with that heavy burden or that heavy heart or that struggle, Lord, that you will lighten that load as you promise us. And Lord, I just pray that they can trust you or, or trust the story that they hear tonight, trust the people that they hear from, and know, Lord, that they're just loved beyond what we can comprehend. We know that you're working in our life and moving in our life before we even realize it. Lord, I just ask that you be with all of us. Allow us just to, to be exactly where we need to be, hear what we need to hear, and, and take it with us as we leave here this evening. Pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey guys, um, I am a grateful child of God and I struggle with codependency and my name is Jen. Hey, um, so I get the privilege and the honor of reading our 12 steps for you tonight and if you will follow along with the biblical comparisons. Here we go, step one. We admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Step two. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2, 13. Step three. We made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. 
Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4, 10. Step seven, we humbly ask him to remove all of our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Step nine, we may direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Step 10, we continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you daily. Colossians 3.16. And step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore that person gently, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. Galatians 6.1. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jen. All right, let's stand up. We're going to sing a little bit. <clears throat> I can't count to the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. There ain't no way you ever let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praying. Is he God? He's God. He is good God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever, that your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? Blood in the morning, I know you're going to be there every day. So what on earth could be? Tell me, is he good? He's good. Tell me, is he God? He's God. He is good God Almighty. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning. Love him 
in the noontime Love him when the sun goes down Good God Almighty I hope you'll find me Praising your name No matter what comes Cause I know where I've been Without your mercy So I keep praising your name Jesus in the noon time, Jesus when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noon time, Jesus when the sun goes down.
give it up for this band one time. <laughs> Okay, can we give God praise one more time for that, that gift of music every week? Every week, man, that's, that's beautiful. Um, we're blessed to have that every week. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. My struggle is with drugs and alcohol, and my name is Seth. So there's uh, some newcomers in here tonight. There's some folks that haven't been in a while. I just want to say welcome or welcome back. This is a place we want you to be at. This is a place that we hope you want to be at. Even if you're just here to get your papers signed, that's okay too, right? We've all had to go there one day. A um, couple quick announcements I want to make. Um, Sunday mornings, uh, we're doing a worship series on the 12 steps. And this week, um, we're finishing up that series with steps 10, 11, and 12. So, I would encourage you, if you don't have a church to go to or you don't have a service to attend this Sunday, show up here. It's a great place. You're welcome here. Um, we have uh, just, a, just a great time worshiping God, and um, you're welcome here. So show up for that. Another thing is we're trying to re, uh, restart our, our children's programs here on Tuesday night. So if you, if you have a heart for children's ministry or you have a heart for... Um, serving in some way, that's an opportunity for you. If you're interested in that, see me after uh, the service tonight and we'll discuss what that looks like. But that is a, a place of need in this ministry because not only does um, our struggles affect ourselves, it affects our families and it affects our children. And so we have a program that will help them um, grow in their faith and help you get a little mini vacation for two hours on Tuesday night. So if you're interested in that, just please um, come see me afterwards. So let's get started. We're on step 12. If you've been with us for the past few months, we, we've gone through all the steps. Now we're on step 12. And this has been a journey, and I hope that you've been applying these things to your life. I hope you've been applying these principles to your life. And I hope you've seen some changes in your life. But when we get to step 12... We're going to look at what we're asked to do at this point in our recovery. It's not over yet, okay? So step 12 says, having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. And so if it's your first night, you're like, "Why? Well, I'm not even going to pay attention because it's step 12 and I'm not even there yet. So don't shut this out. This applies to all of us, right? Um, so when you come to these meetings, I encourage you to take the meat, leave the bones. Like, take what you can out of here to help grow your recovery. Leave what you, leave what you need to leave, okay? But step 12 applies to all of us. The hope at this point and the promise at this point in recovery is that when you reach step 12, when you reach this milestone in your recovery, you won't be the same person that you were when you walked through the door the first time. That's the promise and that's the hope. The hope is that we would experience this thing we call transformation in our, in our, in our minds and this thing we call reformation in our spirit and this sense of gained love for ourselves and love for others, right? That's the hope that we get to. If you're not there and you've been doing this for a long time, maybe you just need to pay attention a little better. Maybe you just need to really surrender a little bit more. Maybe you need to dig in a little deeper because these are the promises that actually come true for us. Some of the other fruits that we gain through working these steps 
And going through this process is honesty. Anybody gained honesty in their recovery? Anybody lose honesty in their addiction? Yeah, big time. If my lips were moving, I was lying. We gain a peace of mind. We gain a little bit of tolerance for things that aren't like us and people that aren't like us. And we gain this thing called selflessness, not selfishness, selflessness. And if you were to sit down at this point in your recovery and make a list of everything that you've gained in your recovery, I'm pretty sure you'd be amazed at what you see. If you really look at it and take an inventory of the things that God has given you, the gifts that you've received through this process, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'd be blessed. Now, here's a, here's a note I want to tell you if you're new or if you're kind of, you know, you haven't really gone deep into this thing. One mistake I made when I first started was I compared where I was to where everybody else was. And what happened was, is I was comparing chapter three in my story to chapter 30 in other people's stories. And what do you think that looked like? It was impossible for me to reach those places with the time and the experience I had in recovery. So if you're walking in here and you're thinking, man, I want to be just like that. If I'm not like that tomorrow, I'm giving up. Clear your mind of that. This is a process, okay? It takes time. It's important to understand that this journey through the 12 steps takes time. It's important for the newcomer and for all of us to look at the steps that we've already gone through to see just where we're at now. If you're not, if you're not there, just look at where this pathway will take you. I'm going to kind of do a review tonight. We're going to review some of the steps and we're going to review some of the principles. And as, as I do this, I'm going to purposely point out the beatitude or the scripture that goes with each principle in these uh, 12 steps. So there's eight principles that go with the 12 steps. I'm going to purposely point out the scripture that goes with it, and you'll see why. So when we go to principle one, which is the first place we start in Celebrate Recovery, principle one says, or the, the scripture says, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. And that's Matthew chapter five, verse three. And that's Jesus' sermon on the mount. And he's, he's teaching people and his disciples the way to live. And I just want you to know why it starts out here. We'll get to that in a minute, but happy are those who know they're spiritually poor. And so this is where we come to step one. And step one, what it does is it shows us this, it shows us this amazing reality that we've been fighting to face in our lives. This amazing reality that we've avoided because what happens in step one is we find that we're totally unable to get rid of our addictions and our compulsive behaviors until we admit that we're powerless over them. And I don't just mean say it. I mean surrender it and admit that I am powerless so there's no way that I can beat this. And that's where step one starts. It takes some people many years to get to that point. It takes people decades to get to that point. And it's so crucial that we do get to that point. Just let me tell you one thing about step one. Step one is the only step that you have to actually get right. All the other ones you're not going to get right. Just forewarning for those perfectionists in the house tonight. You're not going to get those right. This one you have to get right. You have to admit that you're powerless over whatever you're facing and that your life is unmanageable and, and mean it, okay? So then we move into principle two. And the verse for principle two is Matthew 5, 4. And Jesus says, happy are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And that word mourn means a couple different things. But what I think it's referencing here is that we mourn over our past life. Not that somebody has died and we mourn, but that we have died. Our sinful life has died. Our addiction has died. And, and we mourn the way we behave there. And so Jesus is saying, when you mourn over how you used to live, you shall be comforted. And so when we get to step two, 
we're coming out of this situation that we can't control. And then at step two, we start to believe that, man, if I can't do this alone, there's got to be a power greater than me. And so that's where we enter the word higher power. If I can't do this, there's got to be something greater than me. And so when we get to that point, we grow a little bit of faith and we enter into principle three. And principle three, the verse says, happy are the meek. Matthew 5.5. 5. Look up meek and study that sometime. But meek is not what you think. Meek is not like weak and cowardly. Meek is actually a power word. You actually gain power when you get to that point of being meek because you gain a power that you've not had before. And so step three is where we turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. So important. That is a pivot point for our recovery. Everything after that falls in place if we can get step three in our hearts. And so we move to principle four, which says, happy are the pure in heart. That's the verse. Happy are the pure in heart. Now, if we look at principle four, which is step four and five, what are we doing? Okay, we're taking an inventory of the things that brought us to a place of physical, spiritual, and moral bankruptcy. Now, all those things that we've done in our past that have caused us to come to this place have actually, if you think about your heart as being clean, they've actually made our heart dirty. And so happy are the pure in heart. Part of this inventory in step four and the confession, confession in step five is to cleanse all that out of our heart, is to purify our heart. And so this is so crucial that we take a searching fearless moral inventory of ourselves and then we tell somebody about it we tell somebody about it and that's so important that we bring this out and tell somebody about it we finally come to a point where we we face the fact that living alone with our pains and our conflicts and our struggles and our hurts is not working and it's not gonna work so we have to bring somebody else into the situation that's what step five is Step five. So now we move into principle five. I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on with me. Principle five. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. So we start talking about our character here. We start talking about the way we live, our actions, our behaviors. And so we move into step six. And what happens in step six is we face ourselves. We look at ourselves, and the reality is we have character defects. The second reality is there's some character defects we hate and we're ready to get rid of, that we're ready for God to take. But if you're really honest with yourself, there's some character defects that we actually love, and we've actually grown um, to really use to our advantage or use to survive, and we actually love those character defects but we have to get ready to let God change us. And that's where step seven comes in. And step seven says we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings, even the ones that we love, even the ones that give us an advantage, even the ones that nobody else knows about. We ask God to remove it and create the character he wants us to have. And that takes humility. And that takes um, surrender. And that takes acting like you don't know anything. And so then we move into principle six. Principle six, the verse says, happy are the merciful and happy are the peacemakers. What we do in step step eight and nine is we, we start working on our horizontal relationships. We start working on those people that we've um, affected in our, in our addictions and in our, in our behaviors. We call it cleaning house sometimes. Have you ever heard that term? We keep cleaning house in step eight and nine. And what we come to realize is that we've not only hurt ourselves, we've hurt a lot of people around us. Because I don't know about you, but in my addiction and in my struggles, I wasn't the only one who suffered. There's a lot of people around me that 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 suffered because of what I did. And so in this process, in step eight, we begin this peacemaking process, this, this process of forgiving others and asking for forgiveness. And so we list the people we've harmed. And we become willing. That's the key. we got to become willing to make amends to these people. 
And so then we move right into step nine where we make direct amends. And this is not an excuse place. This is a place where we, if we can, we make direct amends to those people um, for the harm that we've done and we, we clean up our side of the street. Okay, so then we move into principle seven and eight. These are the last two principles. And the verses are, happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. You notice how many times it says do what God requires? It's pretty important. So we got to look back at step three there. But happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. And by this time, we hit step 10, and we figured out that this thing isn't going to work unless we just keep doing things every day, right? So... So in step 10, we have to make a daily inventory. We, we take a personal inventory of our character, our behaviors, our actions, our thoughts. And if we're wrong, we promptly admit it. And that, that's so important that we keep doing that, right? And then we move into step 11, where at this point in step 11, we've had some kind of relationship with God. And it might just be a Snapchat relationship at this point, a Snapchat relationship where we just let God see what we want him to see. But step 11, we realize that God has restored our sanity and that he's given us some peace of mind and that he's, he's given us some happiness and that we're actually feeling this thing called self-worth. And so in step 11, we are asked to continue growing in that relationship with God and continue growing in that relationship in our recovery. Whew, that was my introduction. So that was steps one through 11. If you've just showed up, this is your first time, that's a pretty good recap of the first 11 steps. That was not meant to like thrill you and make you jump up and down and amen, all that. That was just an inform informative piece. But you got to know where we came from to know where we're at. That's why it's important. It's hard for somebody to walk in and hear a step 12 talk if they have no clue of the first 11 steps. You don't know where you came, but the, but the journey's important. All those things that we talked about are important because it leads us to this place. And I wanted you to pay attention to those scriptures because it leads us to this place. Step 12, let's look at the first part of it. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps. So it's saying, basically what I see is you're going to have a spiritual experience because of the steps. Anybody agree with me on that? Okay. If you follow this path that we just laid out, that I just laid out for it in, in this informative section, then that journey alone is a spiritual experience. Amen. That journey of actually doing the steps, building a relationship with God, cleaning your past up, cleaning your relationships up, asking God to take care of your character, being humble, is a spiritual experience in itself. When I read that the first time, I thought lightning had to strike me, and I had to see Jesus in my Fruit Loops, and all these things had to be in place for me to experience a spiritual experience. But what I, what I was blind to is I'd already experienced a hundred spiritual experiences because of these steps. So, so you've experienced them as you work this path, okay? And what step 12 tells us, so that's what happened. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of the steps, step 12 tells us that we should respond to the spiritual experience. Make sense? Okay, thank you. I thought you were asleep for a minute. So what do we do? We try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. It is a response to the spiritual experience in the first 11 steps. You're going to have spiritual experiences along the way, but what step 12 is saying is because of all this these things that have happened in the first 11 steps, because all that God has done in our lives, because all that recovery has provided for us, we try to carry the message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. It does not say that if we want to, we carry the message to others. It is telling us that we carry the message and practice these principles in all our affairs. 
And so if we uh, look at those scriptures in the first eight principles of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes, you've heard them called. If we look at what he's teaching in that, in that section, he's teaching something that is radically different from the way people were living in that day. If you think about the people that were living and he was teaching, they were religious people. All they knew was religion. All they knew was their tradition and their religion. And they thought, well, th- I want to go to heaven. This is their, their thinking, right? I want to go to heaven. These are the way I need to go. These are the things I need to do. This is the way I need to be. And Jesus drops this grenade on them, this radically different way that he's teaching them. And he says, this is the way you need to live, not the way you have been living. So you imagine this crowd of people sitting there, and all they know is this tradition and this religion, and this is do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And then Jesus throws a grenade at them, and it touches every nerve in their body because every single one of them, at that point when when they hear this, had to realize that they too are spiritually poor. And that's the first verse he starts out with in this sermon. Blessed are those, happy are those who know they're spiritually poor. That's where the 12 steps start too, right? Blessed are those who know they're spiritually poor. So Jesus drops this grenade that shows them this is the different way to live. He turns their life upside down. And what, they ha- what happens is they realize that they need a righteousness. They need a grace. They need a forgiveness. They need a power. They need a character that they can't produce by themselves. They realize that they can't do this on their own, that he's telling the truth they can't do this on their own. And, and, and if you go a little further in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus actually says, unless your, righteous, unless your righteousness or goodness, however you want to look at it, exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And that point smacks them and says, no, we can't beat that. We can't do better than that. And so you enter a place of spiritually, spiritual poverty. Basically, he's saying you're not getting in on your own. You're not, you're not going to live the life I'm telling you to on your own. The only way you're going to get there, the only way you're going to live this way is if you know the man on the middle cross. Amen? And all this can be summed up. What Jesus is teaching, what we learn in the 12 steps, all this can be summed up as a spiritual experience. When, 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 when life flips upside down and you see something totally different than you've ever seen it before, similar to what the 12 steps tell you, This is the way to live, but I've been living this way. That in itself is a spiritual experience. So what happens when we get to step 12 is very powerful. We looked back, like I just just took us through, looked back at what we've freely been given and the new life and the new gift that we've been given. And I hope that you find that. I hope that you're there tonight. I hope that you've done this, and I hope that you're you're at that place where you can taste a new life. You can feel a new life. That's a gift. The new life is a spiritual experience. And what it should result in, here, here's what you need to pay attention to. The new life, if you say, yes, I have been given a new life through this program, what that should result in is a desire to respond to the new life. It should create a desire to respond and to give back what was freely given to us. How much did you pay to do this program? I didn't pay a dime. It was offered to me by other people who said, this is what I did. Let me walk with you through it. It wasn't a let me walk with you through it, and then when you get done, 400 bucks, I'll invoice you. No, it's freely given to me. The response of the spiritual experience and the gift should be, to give back what was freely given to me. And I want to I look at what Jesus says to his disciples and the people that he's teaching right after the Beatitudes. Have I lost you all? Are you with me? I've, I've kind of lost myself here, but hang with me. So Jesus taught the Beatitudes. Let's call it the 12 steps. That's what it comes from. So now look what he says. He doesn't just stop at saying this is how you should live. Peace out. See you later. He goes on 
and tells them how they should respond. Jesus ain't going to leave you hanging like that. He tells them how they should respond. So I'm going to look at Matthew 5, chapter, or, or verse 13 through 16, which is right after the Beatitudes. Look what he says. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Why does Jesus use salt and light in that? Does anybody get it? If you've studied it a little bit, you probably get it. But why does he use salt and light? Well, I studied this a little bit this week, and what I found out is that salt is really good on French fries. I did some research and development. You know, McDonald's, Wendy's is better, but I, I tried them both. Actually, Hush Puppies from Buddy's Barbecue are the best, but... Salt's good on fries. No, that's not the point. Salt serves many purposes, okay? Jesus chooses salt and light for a reason. Jesus doesn't do anything by accident. He doesn't make mistakes like me. He chooses salt for, for a purpose. But salt itself serves many purposes, and that is the point in why Jesus, I think, uses this example. If salt is not salty... It no longer has a purpose, right? It's useless. What are you going to do with unsalty salt? Well, it's purposeless. It's, it's, that's why he says it's just thrown out. They used to line the roads with useless salt because it's nothing but to walk on it. Salt, though, in those days and still today, is used um, as a preservative, right? So, so in one sense... Being salt of the earth is a way to preserve your faith and your recovery. And, and, and being salt as a preservative can help us from falling back into our old ways. Stay salty, right? What else about salt? Salt permanently changes the flavor of food. You can't put salt in something, then unsalt it. It's changed forever. Just like Christ and recovery permanently change your life. You do something with it. It's changed either way. Another thing about salt, in those days, when Jesus was, was, was preaching and teaching this, Salt was actually used as a form of payment to the Roman soldiers. So that means that salt had a lot of value. If you're getting paid, like, what well, if you show up to your boss and you're like, Here's, where's my paycheck? And he pours out some salt in your hand. What are you, <laughs> Bro, this thing, but salt was valuable in that day. So when Jesus says salt of the earth, he's also putting a lot of value on that. You're valuable. Keep your value. Jesus is referring to having value when he says you are salt of the earth. You are value. One of the other purposes that you might be familiar with about salt is that salt can heal a wound. Did you know that? You want to try it? No, because it hurts, but... <laughs> Salt has healing properties. It can heal a wound. It can prevent bacteria from creating an infection. So if we're salty, if we stay salty, and somebody wounds us out there in that world, it can't turn into an infection. It's a bacteria fighter. By being salt of the earth, we are fighting spiritual bacteria. It can't infect us.
whatever the point Jesus is using salt for, we know that salt by itself is not useful at all. All salt is by itself is salt. It's useless by itself. The value of salt comes only in its application. Salt is just salt until you apply it to something. So salt is not valuable by itself, but what you do with it gives it its value. Somebody come with me on this journey. The same goes for your recovery. (laughs) Oh, your recovery is just your recovery until you do something with it. Somebody come on tonight. The value of your recovery is not measured in the recovery itself. It's measured in the application of your recovery. What you do with your recovery is how your recovery is measured. Otherwise, it's just salt sits there and just be salt. Otherwise, your recovery just sits there and it's just recovery. It's nothing. It's just recovery. It's only valuable when you apply it to something and you use it in your life and in other people's lives. The scripture, Jesus also uses the, the, the example of light. You are salt and light. Light of the world, he says. Once you've been changed by God, you are light of the world. When we are a light of the world, we're a witness to what God and the 12 steps can do in someone's life. Carrying the message, which we talk about in step 12. Because of the spiritual experience, we carry the message. Carrying the message is the same thing as carrying the light. We're carrying the light of Christ. We're carrying the light of recovery. The interesting thing about light, and and this is deep. Jesus chooses to use light, and he says no one hides light under a bowl. They put it on a lampstand so everybody can see it, right? A house built on a hill um, can't be hidden. But but what does light have to have to, to work? What does light have to have to be light? Power. It has to be connected to a power source. If you unplug that lamp, guess what? It's going to turn off. If the fuel in the, the, the oil lamp runs out, the light runs out. A light that does not have the power of God is useless. A light that has no source of power is useless. It must stay connected to the power. We must stay connected to the power of God so that we have a continual source of power so that our light may always be on. Don't let your light turn off. If you get far enough away from God, you lose the power that God so freely has given us through this journey. One way to, man, I'm just coming up with them all tonight. One way to keep power going is through a circuit. If I tie into your circuit, we can both be lit by the same power. (laughs) Man, somebody didn't get that one. I just made that one up. I should get extra credit for that. If I tie into you, you can use my light until you can find your own power source. Come on with it. If you ain't got any power and you ask me to borrow some of my power and I plug into you, you're using the same power that I got to light your light. Mm. In step 12, we become the light, a beacon of light in recovery for those people who are lost and they can't find their way. We become salt for someone who has lost their flavor, and their joy. We become salt for someone who walks through that door with an open wound that's about to get infected, but we can prevent the bacteria. We become light for someone who's walking in the darkness. We become light for someone so that they can find their own way to the true light. 
Someone had to be salt and someone had to be light for me to get to where I am now. I had wounds. I had no power. I was infected. I needed a lot. And somebody had to provide me with their salt and their light to get me to where I'm at today. And without that light, I would have never been able to find the light of Christ had someone not lit the path for me. I would have never been preserved in my faith and in my recovery by the salt of God if someone had not given me a sprinkle of their salt along the way and showed me what it's like to live as salt and light. Worship team, you guys can come back up. Salt and light is scripture, but what it is in the application of where Jesus puts it in his sermon is a response to God's gift. In recovery, where step 12 falls is a response to the first 11 steps that we've worked. If you walk out of here and have the freedom and the the happiness and the peace of mind that the first 11 steps give you and you do nothing with it, you have wasted the grace that God is offering to use through you to help other people. Step 12 is our way of keeping what we have. If you walk out of here and don't give back what was given to you, you will lose what you have. It's proven. I see it too many times. Step 12 is where we stay sober. Step 12 is where we guard and keep guard over our recovery. Step 12 is where we help the person who doesn't think that they'll ever make it. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like you'll never make it? And then somebody comes along and gives you a little hope. And you say, man, for today, I'm going to hang on. I might make it tomorrow. Step 12 is our response to help others who don't think they'll make it. It's not a place to sit down and take a rest and go on vacation. It's actually a place where the real work of recovery and the real work of Christianity begins. You thought you were over with it now. You done worked the steps. It's actually the beginning. Because you know what? You've gotten out of the way now. Our purpose is not us. Our purpose is everybody else. You start living your life that way, worries will start flying away. Stress will start going away. We weren't created for ourselves. We were created for each other. Step 12 is an outer reflection of an inner transformation. You can tell how somebody's changed by the way they work their 12th step. It's an evidence that the heart has been changed and is continually being renewed and transformed by God. The 12th step serves as evidence of a new life. It's evidence that the old life has gone away. The hard fact that we all have to face is that if someone cannot freely give what he or she has freely received, then what they have received is not truly part of them or it's gone away from them. It is, a, it is a response and it is a, a duty to give back what we have been given all the way through the rest of our lives. Step 12 is asking all of us, do we want to keep what we have? Do you want to keep what we have? It's asking us, What is our purpose in someone else's journey? What is our purpose? Will we have a purpose in someone else's life? If you're not there yet and you're just like, man, I don't know what he's talking about. I just know the coffee's free and I can get my sheet signed. That's okay. But we have a blue chip here. And this is a a sign to yourself to everyone in this room that you are tired of living the way you've been living 
It doesn't matter what you struggle with. You could pick one of these up for depression, overeating, anxiety, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, pornography addiction, anger, hurt, trauma, pain, self-worth, self-hate, whatever it is. There's no limit to what this means to you. But it's an open invitation to come as you are and start a new way of life or restart the way you've been living. I ask you to come as you are. Is anybody willing tonight? I'm proud of you, man. I'm proud of you. Love you, bro. Maybe you're a 12-stepper and you hadn't done anything. Maybe this is a response to the gift that you've freely been given and you're ready to give it back to somebody else. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gifts that you give us through these 12 steps, through this program, for this fellowship. God, I pray that no matter where we're at in our journey, that we may respond to your grace and respond to your mercy and respond to your power by being salt of the earth and light of the world. You called us all to be that. You've given us all that we need. God, put it in our hearts, put it in our minds to be willing and obedient to step forward into this world be who you want us to be. I pray that if there's any hurt in here tonight or darkness in here tonight, that it may stay here. It may not leave this room or leave this building. That, that freedom may walk out of these doors tonight. A new freedom. A new peace. A new happiness, God. Less weight. And more joy. Through your power and your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
you won't relent into you have it all my heart is yours you won't relent into you have it all my heart is yours you won't Have it 
Well, thank you, Chris and Barry and Mark. <laughs> and Lauren. <laughs> I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with drugs and alcohol and many other character defects. My name is Jason. Well, here at Celebrate Recovery North, I'd like to celebrate victories and milestones. Before I do that, would anybody like to pick up the chip? Start or restart the program? Anybody? All right. If you have one day or 5,280 days, it's all important. But if you have 30 days clean or any other your mishaps, we have a chip for you. So anybody got 30 days? 30 days? 30 days. Yeah. <clears throat> Does anybody have 60 days? 60? How about 90? 90? How about six months? Hey, all right. What was that? Nine? What was that? Nine? Nine. Nine. Somebody got one year. I know somebody's got a year coming up. <laughs> I know. Oh, nine. Yeah, anybody got nine months? I did do nine. Well, I skipped it. Does anybody have nine months? Somebody just make it up before I give it out. Oh, has anybody got 18 months? Well, I had a year one. Nobody had a year. Has anybody got eight? Huh? Has <laughs> anybody have uh, two years? Anybody have multiple two years? Does anybody have multiple of anything? I've got three years. Three. Yeah, of course. Congratulations. <clears throat> All right. Would anybody like to take the blue chip, start or restart the program? All right, here you go. All right, after this, we have a small group. Anybody willing to participate? It's a really good place to let things out. You know, there's a lot of things we can't talk around other people. We can talk to our fellow people about. So don't forget about small group. So let's stand, and we'll say the serenity prayer. God, Thank you all.